Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma, and we are continuing our examination, our review and refutation of the book uh, by Mr. Paul Ellis. It is entitled AD 70 the e and the End of the World. And pardon me, I hope that you'll go back and you will look at the previous videos that we have done in this series, series so far. And I had promised you last week, uh, week before last, excuse me, uh, thanks to my little round of health issues. But nonetheless, uh, I had promised you that I was going to deal with 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. But, you know, as I continue to read, and, and specifically pages 109 and following in chapter 22, uh, I, I was just simply blown away by the, by the bold, unsubstantiated, unbiblical comments that fly directly in the face of the biblical truth to be found in this chapter. Now, the chapter is entitled, When Are the Days of Vengeance? And I want to read to you a few excerpts beginning on page 109 so that you have a feel for what Mr. Ellis is claiming. And again, the heading of the chapter is, When Are the Days of Vengeance? And he has Luke chapter 21, 20 to 23, cited at the very top of the page. And then he says, when, when prophesying about the fall of Jerusalem, Jesus referred to the days of vengeance. But whose vengeance was it? Why was it brought about? What, is, what does it mean for us? And he says, many theologians say it was divine vengeance. And he cites Eusebius, Chrysostom, and some other early church writers. And he says, the notion of divine punishment, that is AD 70 being divine punishment, is now so widely accepted, it, it, it even appears in some Bible translations. And he uh, cites a New International Revised Version. And then he says, according to some theologians and Bible translators, days of vengeance means days of God's punishment of the Jews. Now listen very, very carefully to what Mr. Ellis says. But God did not punish Jerusalem. The Romans did. God, good. Romans, bad. Sure, Jerusalem had heaped up its sins, but those sins were punished at the cross. The Son of God did away with all sin, including the sins of those who put Him there. If God was punishing the Jews, this is bad news for you because it means the Lamb of God did not carry the sins of the whole world. Apparently, he missed some. But don't panic. As we will see, it is inconceivable that God punished the Jews. They certainly experienced days of vengeance, but it was not divine vengeance any more than the Nazi Holocaust was divine vengeance. To suggest otherwise is appalling. Yet many people do. They blame God for the hell unleashed. And then he asked the question, where did this idea that AD 70 was divine vengeance against the Jews, where did that idea come from? And he blames none other than Josephus. And he gives a citation or two from Josephus. And he says, why did Josephus point the finger at God? Because he was Jewish. As a Hebrew and as a priest, Josephus was well acquainted with Jewish history. He knew all the stories of how God used the Assyrians and the Babylonians to besiege Jerusalem and punish the Jews for their sins. To his Jewish mind, the Romans were just another tool in the hands of an angry God. And then he gives other citations. And then on page 111, about the fourth paragraph down, he says, Needless to say, the Jewish defenders hated Josephus for being a turncoat. They did their best to drop rocks on his head. Josephus was off his rocker, they thought. He had Stockholm Syndrome. The Romans 
were not God's agent, but his enemies, seeking to erect their abominable idols in the temple. And then he has another heading entitled Righteous Romans. And he says, The city fell and the temple burned because God was a Roman and he wore a Roman sword. Or so we are told, according to Mr. Ellis. Seditious Jews were dug out of hiding places because they could not hide either from God or from the Romans, according to Josephus. Defenders fled from towers because they were ejected out of them by God himself, again, citing Josephus. And then, rather sarcastic, that's all in sarcasm, by the way, from Mr. Ellis. And he adds this, with so much aid from the Lord, it's, it's a wonder the siege lasted as long as it did. Titus could have sent his legions home for, home for with God on his side, he barely needed, pardon me, barely needed them. And he says all the reason for this is, ignorant of all that Christ accomplished on the cross, Josephus viewed God through an old covenant lens. If the Jews were slaughtered, it was because God was angry with them. But why? Josephus had no answer beyond vague allusions to wickedness, avengedness, and general impiety. Look, uh, to suggest that Josephus was vague, uh, that's disingenuous. I'm sorry, that's just really, really bad. Anyway, according to Josephus, Mr. Ellis says, the destruction of Jerusalem was divine vengeance, pure and simple. But although the teaching, uh, the teaching came from Christians, it root, its root was undeniably Jew, Jewish. The vengeful God was more Josephus than Jesus. And then he accuses those who would say that AD 70 was a result of God's vengeance against Jerusalem of being racist. Because after all, he said, Paul loved the Jews. Paul loved the Jews to be sure, folks. But does that mean that Paul did not see the impending judgment on Jerusalem as coming as a direct judgment from God? No, he didn't. And to suggest that, well, but, well because Paul loved the Jews, that means that he could not envision the coming destruction as judgment from God. We, we have to ask the question, okay, uh, did Isaiah love the Jews? Well, yes, he did. But he knew without a fact, and he predicted the destruction of the ten northern tribes at the hands of the Assyrians. Well, wait a minute. Didn't Isaiah love the Jews? Oh, and by the way, Mr. Ellis wants to say Jesus took care of all, all of the sins of the world at the cross. Therefore, A.D. 70 was not a judgment on Israel for her sins. Well, wait a minute. If Christ took away all the sins of the world, then how could Mr. Ellis admit and agree, as he does, that the destruction of the ten northern tribes was a judgment from God for Israel's sin? I mean, after all, Jesus was going to die in 600 years, 700 years, to take away Israel's sin. So why did God bring judgment on Israel, the ten northern tribes. And by the way, in Isaiah chapter 10, 5 and following, I want you to look at the language very carefully. In anticipation of the destruction of the ten northern tribes at the hands of the Assyrians, the Lord said, Woe to Assyria! Now, remember, God's going to use the Assyrian to destroy the ten northern tribes, but guess what? <laughs> Assyria has hers coming as well. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him, I will send Assyria, against an ungodly nation, against the ten northern tribes, and against the people of my wrath. 
I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so. It is simply in his mind to destroy and to cut off not a few nations. What do we have here? Number one, Assyria was the instrument of God's wrath against the ten northern tribes for Israel's sin. But wait a minute. Once again, Mr. Ellis says on the cross, God took away all the sins of the world. Why did he not take away the sins not only of the ten northern tribes, but of Assyria as well? This is divine judgment against the ten northern tribes and then against Assyria, guess what, that the Babylonians brought about. And the Babylonians were ungodly, just like the Assyrians were ungodly. And I've already cited to you Micah chapter 1, 3 and following, that predicted that the Lord was coming out of heaven to tread on the, on the tops of the mountains. The mountain, mountains would melt under his feet. The earth would be destroyed. And all of this, it says, because of the sins of Israel. Thus, the destruction of the ten northern tribes, 721 B.C., was a direct judgment from God for Israel's sins. At the, at the hands of an ungodly nation. It was a day of vengeance against Israel. Now, we move forward in time. In Isaiah chapter 34, God predicted the destruction of Edom. And Edom was going to be destroyed, guess what? By the sword of the Lord. My sword is bathed in heaven with the blood of Basra and Edom. And guess what it's called? The day of vengeance of our God. So the destruction of Edom, which by the way happened in 583 BC at the hands of the Babylonians, the Babylonians who were the sword of God would destroy Edom due to her sin. And once again, how could that be true if Christ took away all the sin of the world on the cross? Why wasn't that retroactively uh, effective? But you see, it was because of her sins that the day of vengeance came upon Edom. Malachi chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, looks back on the destruction as an accomplished reality. Well, guess what? Edom was, or excuse me, Babylon was a horrific people. Well, guess what? In Jeremiah 51, 20 and following, the Lord speaks of the coming destruction of Babylon at the hands of the Medes. I'm going to turn over there. I, I, I don't want to quote that. I want to, I want to read that directly to you because it is so incredibly powerful. Speaking to or about the Medes, whom he was going to use to destroy Babylon, the Lord says to and of the Medes, you are my battle axe and weapons of war. For with you, I, with you, I will break the nation of Babylon in pieces. With you, I will destroy kingdoms. With you, I will break in pieces the horse and its rider. With you, I will break in pieces the chariot and its riders. With you, I will break in, uh, in pieces man and woman. With you, I will break in pieces old and young. With you, I will bring, break in pieces the young man and the old. And he, and he just continues, with you, I will do this. I will destroy Babylon. Why? Because of her sin. So here is a judgment on Babylon from God and God using the Medes as his 
sword. With you, I will do this. Now, let's go back to Deuteronomy 32. Speaking of Israel's last days, which incorporated A.D. 70, the Lord said in Deuteronomy 32, now look, twice, twice, Deuteronomy 32 tells us it's about Israel's last days. It is about the last generation of Israel, which would be the crooked and perverse generation that Peter said was his generation. And in Deuteronomy 32, I'm going to begin reading with verse 32. Their vine, that's the vine of Israel in her last days, is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of serpents and the cruel venom of cobras. You get the idea? This is Israel being guilty of sin. And if you don't believe it's guilty of sin, then you need to go back in verses 18 and following. She committed abominations against God. Is this not laid up in store with me, sealed up among my treasures? Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand. When would it be at hand? It wasn't at hand when Moses wrote this. It would be at hand in the last days. After many generations, after Moses wrote, in the day of the perverse generation, again, that Peter and that Paul applied to the first century generation. The Lord will judge his people. Wait a minute. The Lord will judge his people in the last days. When he, brings, when he would bring vengeance on them. Well, in the first century, the first century was the last days. Christ appeared in the last days, Hebrews chapter 1, 1 and 2. Paul was living at the end of the age, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Peter said he was living in the last time, 1 Peter chapter 1, 19 and 20. So they were living in the very days foretold by Deuteronomy. But Deuteronomy foretold that in the last days, in Israel's last end, God would bring vengeance. God, not the foreign country, separate and distinct from, independent from God's vengeance and God's wrath and God's judgment. But God, through those enemies, would bring vengeance. And he says, I will judge my people. And thus in Luke chapter 21 and 22, when Jesus said of the impending fall of Jerusalem, these be the days of vengeance. Now watch this. In which all things that are written must be fulfilled. Did the Old Testament foretell, foretell <coughs> the days of vengeance from God's judgment on Israel? In the last days? Yes, it did. By the way, Isaiah chapter 65, the Lord God will slay you. Isaiah 65, 13 and following. Not the Romans, independent from, distinct from God using the Romans. No, no, no. God was using the Romans. And thus, Mr. Ellis's rather sarcastic comments on page 111. The city fell and the temple burned because God was a Roman and wore a Roman sword. Seditious Jews were dug out of hiding places because they could not hide, either from God or from the Romans. Defenders fled from the towers because they were ejected out of them by God himself. Unquote. Well, I'm sorry, ridicule and sarcasm is not an argument. What we have seen then is that God used the Assyrians. They were his sword. They were his rod of anger against the ten northern tribes. And God judged the ten northern tribes. God came in that judgment, Micah chapter 1. 
Likewise, God used the Medes to destroy Babylon, who had destroyed Jerusalem. And they were God's instrument. By the way, uh, you know, the many, many instances in the Old Testament of God using this nation or that nation to judge another nation. Oh, boy. Oh, pardon me. Oh, sorry about that, folks. I'm not going to start or stop and start all over. <laughs> okay. So, here, God used the Assyrians to destroy, to destroy the ten northern tribes. He used the Babylonians to destroy Judah and Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar was his sword. Oh, Ezekiel chapter 32. Ba Babylon was his sword to destroy the Egyptians. And then he used the Babylonians, excuse me, the Medes, with you, I will do this against Babylon. Now, once again, let, let me say this, because this is so important. If Christ took away all the sins of the world at the cross, was that, why was that not retroactive? After all, according to Zechariah chapter 14, uh, the, the river of living waters flows both ways, both some to the hinder sea, some to the former sea. So if the blood of Christ covered the sins prior to the cross, then evidently Isaiah was wrong when he said that Assyria was God's sword of judgment of wrath against the ten northern tribes. So wh why would God judge the ten northern tribes for their sins at the hands of Assyria if God, through Christ, was going to forgive their sins 800 years later, 700 years later? Why would God judge Jerusalem and Judah in 586 B.C. for their sin? And you ought to read Jeremiah chapter 23, the last two verses of the text to see it was because of her sin that she fell. It was because of her sin that God turned his back on her. It was because of her sin that he brought Babylon on her. You see, uh, Mr. Ellis is just out on a limb. He is so far out, out in left field here that it is absolutely amazing. AD 70 was, in fact, the judgment from God because Jesus had ascended to the Father, he was going to come via the Romans in the glory of the Father. As the Father had judged Israel, as he had judged Assyria, as he judged Edom, as he judged Egypt, as he judged Babylon, he judged Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And thus, Mr. Ellis's attempt to deflect and to say, well, you know, uh, if A.D. 70 was a judgment from God, then God was a racist. Or God didn't love Israel. No. God loved Israel, but because He loved them, He chastised them and, and judged them. God loved Judah. Remember Jeremiah? Oh, that my tears might run down like waters. And like rivers of water, Jeremiah chapter 8. But that same prophet said judgment was coming, and it came because of Jer Jerusalem's sin. And so, once again, I say that Mr. Ellis's attempt in his book, AD 70 and the End of the World, is really a, a, an absolutely horrible distortion of the biblical narrative. Christ came. He came in judgment. He came in judgment of Judah and Jerusalem. He came in AD 70. Hey, thanks for joining me for this morning's morning musing. By the way, uh, if you want a uh, an in-depth examination of a bunch of Old Covenant uh, passages that speak of God using this nation against that nation, God saying that they were His instrument, he, he, they were His tool, they were His sword, they were His rod, Get my book, The Element Shall Melt with Fervent Heat.
I document this over and over and over again, and I show how, as I've just stated, that's how Christ came in judgment in A.D. 70. So go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com, and order the book, The Elements Shall Melt With Fervent Heat. Send me a note that says you saw the book on YouTube or Facebook, and I'll refund your shipping. That'll save you $5. Okay, thanks so much for joining me for this morning's Morning Musings. You have a fantastic and safe weekend. I'll see you on Monday.